with all that cross. But yeah, so the model we built last time was on disease contagion. And just to remind you of its structure, while maybe some of you want to go go get it from the core site, others of you at least have your any logics up to to you know have it in front of you from last time. We had three compartments, uh, three stocks, susceptible, infected, from recovered. And we have um, several processes, several types of chain uh, infections and recoveries from infection. Now, right now, is this for a fixed or a sort of, in other words, a constant or a changing population? Constant population. People are either in this stock or they're in this one or that one. We call this a closed population. That's the term of art. You'll see me mention it and you may see it on the final exam. A closed population means no one's coming in, no one's leaving. By contrast, an open population involves either or commonly both of people coming in and people leaving the population. What are a few processes by which People might come into a population. Good, birth, yeah. Uh, birth, good. Is that the only one? Yes, yeah, Rachel. Yeah, immigration. Right, that's right. Um, so we might have immigration. How about people leaving the population? Death and immigration. And immigration. Yeah. Um, or. Uh, you, know, you could argue that in a certain sense, someone might leave the population and it's like circulating as far as risk of infection when they're in a place that shields them from it. Maybe they're they're in a um, facility that that shields them from contact with others in the outside world, uh, uh, like a hospital or something like that. Um, but uh, commonly we have death or, or emigration being the main points of focus. Um, People might travel as well without emigrating. They might, you know, be away for some time, et cetera. This model does not capture that. That's outside the scope of this model. What features in this model are exogenous? What what components do we tell to this model? Yes, Nicholas. Uh, Good contacts per day and transmission probably. And there's actually a third one. That's kind of implicit here. It's it's this one here. We we kind of put in a placeholder there. It's kind of a hidden constant. And the first thing I'd like to do, just to ease some scenario building, uh, in which we will engage, is I'd like to actually replace that with um, uh, with a you know have a, actually a constant there, so we could easily a parameter, so we could easily change our assumptions about. It. Said, said parameter. Okay. Um, so I'm going to go add a parameter, and you can start this while I'm ensuring that my tablet doesn't run out of juice here. So here we go. For this parameter, we're going to do um, uh, so uh, default recovery time. I'm, I'm just, it's probably uh, a rather inartful name, but I'm going to give it a value of three. What does three mean here? Anyone remember? What's the time unit of this model? Days. days, yeah. You can always check that by going up to the model here and seeing the model time unit is days for the model as a whole in the properties window there, okay? Default recovery time. And I'm going to now go and we're going to go to the system dynamics palette we're going to drag a link from there until mean time to recover. And for now, we're going to make that default recovery time. Why would we do that? Um, this is nothing deep about model. It's not something deep about modeling, but in any logic, it's actually really important. The distinction between a parameter, uh, an assumption being captured in a parameter being versus being just hard coded in this. So called dynamic auxiliary variable. Anyone knows what's the what's the role of a parameter in any blockchain? Yes, Nicholas. The ability to change uh, value of the file. 
So we we could change it on the fly, but what's more notable is that um, it allows you to uh, to handle different assumptions about that parameter. So you can specify different values for that parameter and, and communicate them to the model. In this case, it's the thing that, so if you have a parameter a certain place in your model, let's say here in Maine, the thing that specifies the assumption to be used for that parameter is wherever this thing gets created. And Maine basically gets created by scenarios or experiments, hence the X. And so you'll know because if it, it's because it's a parameter, it's in here. If I deleted it as a parameter, if I went back to it not being a parameter, um, uh, you know, I could have put the three back in there, but it wouldn't be among those. It wouldn't be an option to specify alternative values. It's by making it a parameter in main that I can, in scenarios, specify different values for it. So here, are all three of our as Nicholas observed, sagely, um, uh, all three of the quantitative assumptions here about this model. Do you see that? All three of those quantitative assumptions. Um, those are what? Those are endogenous or, ed or exogenous? Exogenous. We tell them to the model. What things in this model are endogenous? Yes, course of infection is endogenous. It is calculated by the model as it runs. It's a generated property model, it's an emergent property model. We don't tell the model what assumptions to have for course of infection over time and start their way up, how it changes in some pre specified way over time. It's instead determined by the interaction of the state of all. And and assumptions about parameters. I'm saying force of infection depends on the state of the model. That's important. What is force of infection? Yes, Patrick. I have a question. Is it uh, mean sign of the result three also endogenous because it's defined by parameters? Uh, mean time until recovery. I would count this here because it's simply dictated by this. I would count it as exogenous. It's basically purely dictated by what we specify for this. Um, now, technically you could say, well, it's a dynamic variable, it's calculated it over time, but the role it plays, the function it plays in the model is, is, is an exogenous one. It just takes on a value, a fixed value and uses it, a pre-specified value. So I would call that exogenous, even though nominally it's, it's a dynamic variable. It, that's kind of immaterial. It functions, the role it plays is really just um, using our assumption, okay? Um, okay, but on what, on what aspect of model C does force, well, what is force of infection? I described it here, probably from, I think I was standing on one of these squares right over here. Oh, what is what is the force of infection characterized? What is that? Yes, the chance of a susceptible becoming infected for the next day. I couldn't have said it quite. That's just awesome. Is it a probability? This is a tricky question. Is it a probability? Is it limited to being between zero and one? Could it be less than zero? No, it can't be less than zero. Could it be greater than one? It could be. What would it mean if the force of infection was, God forbid, uh, you know, two? What would it mean in terms of how long, on average, they remain susceptible before getting infected? Remember, force of infection is a rate. It's like our alpha. Do you remember that? We have this is a first order delay. Do you remember this? Do you recognize your friend? I know some of you was probably a fan. But no, sorry, sorry, for some probably not like that. But it's yeah. it's fine. This is a first. This is a, a first order delay. Why do I say it's a first order delay? 
it looks like a first order delay. It's actually, because this is changing, um, it, it's, it's actually not technically purely a first order delay, but its value is given by the value of the stock times some rate. Now, in this case, the rate is changing over time. That's different from first order delay where it's fixed. So I, I'd say it's kind of inspired by first order delay. But this rate, this alpha, this chance per unit time that you'll leave this state. Remember how long you spend in the state relates to that, right? If you have alpha, if you have this chance per unit time of leaving, this is what force detection, as Tyler said, an extemporian voice, no less, you know, that is uh, a public for dead. This is important. He spoke with clarity and reason and accuracy. Um, it's not it's not actually a probability. It can be greater than one. What would it mean if this is greater than one? If it's two, what would it mean about the average time they spend in the susceptible state before moving on? Half a day. And where where Patrick did that number of half come from? Well, okay, okay, it, it came from one over the force of text, right? Remember, when we have a probability curve in a time of leaving, the average time in the stock is given by what? The reciprocal of that, one over, right? Do <laughs> you remember this? You don't, I don't remember it. Tempted as way to close the door and like stand up here and shout it. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> like, what the fuck is that in terms of the quantitative component? <laughs> Please, let me convey upon you. If you have a first order delay, so you have a sock X and you have some rate alpha of leaving, the formula for this is what? This is a probability per day, right? The formula for this is what? Speak on with one voice, like the Greek chorus. Yeah, that did sound like the Greek chorus, but I couldn't understand what the chorus was say, so I know just put it down. Alpha times X, right? Like the oracle of the alpha. I couldn't understand what it was saying. Um, it's alpha times x, right? What's if the unit of x is people? What's the unit of alpha got to be? People. Okay, okay but but let's let's mark. I, I think you're pointing to an essential truth. What's the what's the dimension got to be? If the dimension of the stock is first. The dimension of the flow is what people per day. And so if alpha times x has dimension people per day, um, people per day, and if x has dimension people, right? Um, I'm, I'm gonna write dimension with this kind of uh, funny square bracket notation, then what is the unit, what is the dimension of alpha? One over dead. One over day. Do you see that? You multiply a one over day times persons, you get a person per day. Yeah. But what does one over day mean? Yeah, it's like a frequency. Frequency. So I like that. Um, that's very, very true, actually. Um, so this is like how how frequently people people leave, right? Um, if alpha is very, very low, they, low, they leave with low frequency, that's, that's true. But this one here in the numerator can also be interpreted as a what? Probability. I believe that was Mark who spoke. And again, he spoke with accuracy, reason, and clarity. Yes, that's exactly right. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to try to point my. This is probably a um, cool there, but I'm going to try to point.
try to uh, point it out here. This this probability could be interpreted. This could be interpreted. The one can be interpreted as probability. What does one mean dimensionally? Anyone? What does it mean? It means it's, it's actually a funny term for it we use. So if you're from engineers sometimes, or this is a, it's actually not quite accurate, but it's a, it kind of sticks in your mind once you hear it. It's unit dimension. That's a better way to put it, actually. But we also hear that it's dimensionless. But really it means uh, that it's of unit dimension. What's that saying? I am tempted to mount the chair and say this, but when I tried to do it for a class last spring, I almost fell and <laughs> broke my head open. So um, I think I'm going to try to discretion is the better part of valor, if I may, dear viewers. Um, so what, what this means is it's independent of units. It's independent of, of our unit system. It doesn't matter what units we are. Where is it sent? If we if we look, if we ask what fraction of this rug is covered by furniture. Hmm? Does it matter whether does that number change if we're if we're using square meters versus square feet to capture capture area? No, why doesn't it matter? The fraction of the room that's covered by furniture. She divides you the same way. Yeah, you're divided. It, it cancels, right? We have like, um, we have like area of furniture, uh, divided by area of room, right? Um, by area of furniture, I mean like, you know, so many square meters are covered by furniture, um. An area of room is like the room size is so many square meters, or I can do it in square feet. No matter no matter what unit I use, it cancels. Do you see that? It's like square meters over square meters, right? Maybe this is horrible. Um, maybe this is something like I don't know, um, uh, five by six square meters or something like that, like thirty square meters for the room, and maybe. Half of it is covered by furniture, 15 square meters. So it's like 15 over 30 square meters in both cases, and they cancel. Do you understand that? So the fraction of, of the room that's covered by furniture is a dimensionless quantity. It doesn't matter what unit system we have. It's not going to change. It's not going to be different if we quantify it in the US with the antiquated and quite quite horrendous and dangerous imperial units, or we do it uh, in, in metric units, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, it's gonna be the same number. And another thing that we can do for this in the same way is probabilities. A probability can be viewed as the number of, if you're flipping a coin, the denominator is number of coin flips, count of coin flips, coin flips. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And in the numerator might be coin flips that are one, the turn up pens, right? Uh, that are pens. Okay, um, that's a probability, right? Uh, if, if you have if you have many coin flips that turn up heads, it's fifty percent of the coin flips turn up head. You're dealing with an estimated probability of point five, right? If it's seventy. 75% of them that turn up heads, you know, 0.75, then you're dealing with the probability of 0.75 to get heads. So this is independent of our units of counting coin flips. We should count coin flips at thousands of coin flips or per coin flip or millions of coin flips. It doesn't matter. It's, it's in the numerator and denominator. It's a fraction. Do you get that? It's independent of dimension. In this case, Order dimension is for counting coin flips, which is admittedly a bit more common, a less common, I think, for you to think about than areas. So this one can be interpreted as a probability, the fraction of times the coin turns out. You understand that? That I, that basic idea? 
it's independent of the unit of time. Okay, so so that's good. Um, but now let's suppose I want to characterize the mean. So this is our chance per unit time of leaving the stock or our frequency of leaving the stock, right? Um, what is the mean time in the stock? What is it? What's the formula for the mean time in the stock? I'm going to call that tau. And what is that in terms of alpha? Sorry? One over alpha. And what are its units? If the mean time is, uh, guess what? It's a, begins with T, ends with an E. Time, it's a time. Mean time is a time, right? Huh? Oh, help me folks uh, get it. Maybe all of you got your shots yesterday. Um, so, so, so it, it has the right, Units, right? And that's the right dimension, right? It's it's going to be days or units here, days. Um, uh, and and this would be one over day. This would be days, right? So when we have a rate, like force of infection, a chance per unit time of leaving, a chance per day, as Tyler said earlier, pointed out, the mean time in susceptible is going to be one over that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, now, so that's what the mean force of infection is. And I argue that that force of infection is not a constant, but instead it depends on parameters, but also on something else. What other thing, on what other thing in the model does it depend? On the, Like the top of it. Yeah, on, on the what? Yeah, the number of effects. On the state of the model. That's something different. We didn't see that before. We didn't see a case where my rate of developing some condition depends on like the number of people who have that condition already. No, 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 no. We didn't see that. We were dealing with like fixed rates. Now it does. It depends on the number of effects. Mm. So that, that's the difference of feet. That's a this is where the nonlinear argument is. And then we had recovery uh, from this. Okay, so, so that was just a kind of a bit of a weave review of, of this. Now I'd like to uh, write down the essential formulas here. And we're going to use a bit of shorthand. That. Okay. Um, so if we denote contact per day as C, find the slide on yeah. it's uh departmental infection, uh can affect the infection disease model. Contact per day C, transmission probability, we're gonna call it beta. That's a kind of funny symbol with the one. Well, long, long uh, tail down. Um, in Britain and many Commonwealth countries, we probably be called Vina. Um, and what other parameter could we have? Anyone say? What's the other parameter? We just added it uh, 10 minutes ago. Yeah, the total recovery time, which we're going to call mu. You okay. could call it tau, I'm going to call it mu. Um, kind of like you in the long, long, long tail. Okay. Um, does anyone remember the formula for this flow for infection? Does anyone remember that? What was the formula for that? Number of susceptible. Sorry, sorry, the number of. Okay, number of susceptible. Yeah, so I, I like. Actually, for the force of infection, that's that one up here. Does that directly depend on the number of susceptible? The force of infection doesn't, but the infection does. And maybe I'll ask for infection. Let's do force of infection first. 
course of convection is commonly called lambda, and it varies with time. And what's what's the formula for it? This is the chance per unit time someone will be affected. What was the formula? And you remember that key formula I put together in the closing minutes of class? Yes. Um, your, um, your clarity of thinking is matched by your your uh, clarity of observation. Here, you go on. So that's awesome. Contacts per day, that's what, which of these parameters? C, time, prevalence of infection. So I wanted to write that. I'm going to call susceptible F effective I the recovered R, and I can use the total population size, which right now is a constant is N. So what would the prevalence effect be? What would the fraction of the population that's affected right now be? I divided by N. Good. And then transmission probably, which is what? Either, right? Yeah. Okay. And now infection, so infection flow is hard to say to the observe. Infection flow is given by what? Infection flow. I'll just write it out here. What what was that given by? It's actually force of infection times the right? It's as if it's a first order delay, except think of it as a first force of infection. So it's lambda times f or f times lambda. Okay, so we to unpack that further, we're going to put these all. This is our chance for unit time will get infected, as we said earlier by Patrick. It's it's a probability per unit. Tyler said it's probability per unit time. It could be greater than one. It would just mean a value greater than one would mean a mean time is susceptible less than one, right? Do you, you get that? A, a value of fourth of infection of two means mean time is susceptible of, we said it earlier, a, a fourth of infection of 10 would mean a mean time infected, I uh, mean, it's susceptible of what? One ten. Yeah, one over 10. Right? Um, okay. So that's our probability for unit time. And infection. Is this alpha, this uh, lambda times f, which is c is f times c times i over n times a. Okay. Now, this it turns out will be full of insights for us. And I want to point out. Uh, I'm going to use a couple of variants in ways of writing this um, in, in coming time. Sometimes we'll write it instead as I times C times F over N times beta. Because F over N is the fraction of the population that is what? Susceptible. And it turns out that's going to be really an important thing to throttle how many people each infective can affect. Mm -hmm. um, so this formula here is 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 basically lambda, the probability uh, per unit time uh, of Gosh, susceptible getting infected, right? Um, getting infected. It's a hazard rate, a chance per unit time. We call it a hazard rate. Um, in statistics, you'll sometimes hear it called a probability density. Okay. And this guy here, or this gal here, um, is going to be the, for each infective. This will be the number of people that infective 
effects per unit time. Because each effective is going to have, have how many contacts? Six. Right? That's, that's what we're assuming here contacts per day. Let's go up to 100. Suppose half of those contacts are susceptible. That's S over N. So suppose they have con total contact per day of 100. Of those, half of them are susceptible. Then they have contacts with how many susceptibles per day? If they have contacts with 100 people per day total and half of them are susceptible, how many susceptibles do they have contacts with per day? 50 per day, right? That's just this times this, C times S over N. And then for each of those contacts, they have, they have a chance of beta of what? This effective as a chance beta of giving them the infection, right? So this is going to be um, number of infections, uh, new infections, new infections caused uh, by infected, uh, each infected, um, each infected per unit time, each infected, each of these I per unit time. So maybe each day, each infective with this right now infects two people per day or infects five people per day because maybe C is 100 and if the brand is half and, and then maybe beta is 0.1. So these are two different ways of understanding it. If you look at my notes, the slides, you'll find some elements of this. But I want to push forward here. I want to I want to push forward and try some further thinking uh, about what's going on here. Okay, first of all, I would like to do some modifications of our assumptions about a model. Because remember, one of the advantages of a model um, will be looking at different outcomes for different assumptions. Assumptions here in the form of exogenous assumptions, the parameters. So first of all, we should make note of what's going on now. To, do, to that end, let's go to the palette and let's quickly go down to analysis. And I'm going to drag in a time plot. And here we go. Oh, oh, thank you, thank you. I'm so grateful. Um, yeah. I'm hoping person X online should identify themselves. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Abby. Great. Great. I, I welcome people in the class being online. It's just helpful for me to who's online, who's not. Okay. So um, here we go. For the time plot, this will be stocks time plot. And we're going to add in a, uh, a value to be shown for susceptible. Yeah. Yeah. And then another one for infective. Good. Infective. And then yet another one for recovered. Okay. Recovered. Here we go. Um, and I'm going to make those the title as well, so that we not only have they shown, we, we actually know what we know what color is used for each of them. Okay. So susceptible, here we go. Okay. Okay, so let's run this model. Let's remind ourselves what's going on. Does anyone remember what what we should see? What do we see in terms of the number of susceptibles? Anyone? What will that do? Will it go upwards? Will it upwards? What will it do? Yes, Mark. And then slower than stocks. Susceptible? Susceptible. Okay, good. Decreasing. Susceptible should be decreasing. Why is it decreasing? There's a, yeah, there's only an outflow. There's no inflow. And that inflow is, as the infection starts to spread, it, it's drawn down. So that's good. 
Um, don't worry, I'll show you the, 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 the plot in just a moment. But how about um, here for uh, infective? What does that do? Mark was starting to address it. Mark? Good. That's right. That's right. Why does it go up faster and faster initially? Why does it snowball? Why does it rise just faster and faster? Anyone? Why does it go faster, rise faster? Let's 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 go. And okay, we'll we'll go see that. We'll talk about it. How about recovered? What does that do? Does that wiggle around in an oscillation or what? What does it do? It's the nature of the structure of this that it does something. What is that that great part? So it's Yeah, it goes up and then it plateaus, right? It can't wiggle around. Why why can't it oscillate around? There's no outflow, right? <laughs> it can do is accumulate. So here we go, right? Um there we go. So we have just like Mark observed, susceptible starts high, and it's virtually all the population, virtually except for one person who starts infective, and then it plummets, right? As people get infective, number of susceptible number of infective rises faster and faster initially. Why? Why does it go faster and faster here? When we see faster and faster, what what sort of feedback is that commonly associated with? Sorry, what sort of feedback is associated with like unstable behavior, divergent behavior, things going faster and faster and boosting the the the, the feedback boosts itself, boosts the initial change that kicked it off. Reinforcing, Reinforcing feedback, a positive feedback, not positive in a normative sense. It's not necessarily always good. It can be horribly bad, like spread as COVID, but um it. And it's positive in the sense that it boosts itself, it adds to itself, it doesn't push back against the original chain, you know, uh, it, it boosts it. So what, what is that feedback right now? What's that positive feedback involved in that spread? Goodness, my mask broke and I am maskless. Maybe that's gonna lead to a positive feedback in the spread of infection. Um, so that, that's okay. I think I have another one in here. Thanks, thanks, Rachel. But um, I'll, I'll keep it uh, in mind. I so appreciate that. Um, so uh, yes, Nicholas. Good, good. So the more infectives. The more contacts with infectives, the more new infections, and the more um, the the infectives grow further, right? And and you get one infective infecting two, infecting each of them infecting two, infecting four more people, and, and it just grows gangbusters. Um, a bit worse for the wear. It's in my bag of tricks. Okay. Um, Hang on. Um, so, so that's right. We have this one infective breeds more contact with the infective, therefore more new infectives, therefore more infectives, and it builds on itself, right? One begets two, two begets four, four begets eight. I mean, it compounds, it builds on itself. Does that go on forever in your thought? And why not? Why does it plateau out at the top? Why does it reach the The number of susceptibles is getting smaller and smaller. As it grows, like gangbusters, you know, up, up here, that look at, as it's growing, this green, green um, rise. The, the number of susceptibles is falling over that time. And so that makes it harder and harder for each infected to infect more people. They have to search, my goodness, search out the people to infect, right? Because 
fewer and fewer people around them are susceptible. This S over N is getting smaller, smaller, and and they'll be limited how many people they can affect. And eventually at the top, what's going to be the case there? What's going to be the case at the top? I'm going to stop. It's in balance. It's not going up and not going down. It looks a bit pointy here, but if we if we add an update, maybe maybe to make it less pointy, I'm gonna go update it so that it will display every my goodness, uh every 0.1 days. I may regret this, but I weighed on the side. Um uh, you can uh aid in modeling distress. Um, okay, so this is rising and you see it actually kind of maxes out. Now I, I'm gonna have to have it display more points. This is, so because it did that, it ran, it, it has a dumb small limit on the number of points. I don't know why they insist on such an impoverished limit in any logic by default. We're gonna have it um, display a hundred time units and it'll display up to, and I'm gonna say a thousand samples here. There we go. Um, Cause we're displaying 10 per ton unit and there's a hundred ton units. Okay, um, so here we go. It's, it's rising and there we go. Um, you notice, why does it plateau? At the point it's plateaued, at the point that that stock is maxed out, what must equal what? When a stock is no longer rising, it's no longer falling, it's in stasis, it doesn't go up and it doesn't go down. What does that mean? Speak on Nicholas. Uh, in flow is equal outflow. And I heard it's echo. Word is that uh, stock that's positive. Let's write that down. What do we mean? Hearing no objections, I will do so. So the formula for infection we already have written. Um, so the formula for infection is S is a bit on the, the dark side, not not in the sense of Darth Vader, but the, the dark. Um, so I'm going to write S and then C times I over N times data. What am I writing down here? I'm saying under what conditions is the inflow equals the outflow, right? Under what condition is, and it's kind of, let's see, where am I? Kind of to read these things called flat infection equals recovery. The formula for this, we have the heat is very poor. Right there. Let's go to our down to the left. And what I'm saying is when infection peaks, the inflow for the infection stock. When infection maxes out up there, just over the top there, this inflow does what? It has what relationship for recovery? Equal that. And so what's the formula for recovery? Be gone? Stock divided by me time. I believe I heard a stop at this point for that. They said in Newton, one recognizes the Y and the Y. And, and I, I heard the voice that I speak. Hey, so under what case will will this be true? But under what conditions will this be true? Well, there's kind of two conditions under which this is true. One of them is rather trivial, and one of them is is more interesting. What's the trivial condition for which this would be true? Mark, I equals zero. Yeah, I equals zero. What what is that? What is that saying that these two are equal when I equals zero? Like how do we express that? When you have no you have you have no Yeah, when we have no infectives, there's no new infection. Mm -hmm. Takes two to tango, there's no new infection, and there's no recovery, right? So that kind of makes sense. But if I is not equal to zero, 
What do we have now? How can we simplify that to, we know that I is not equal to zero? What can we do? Yeah, we could divide both sides by I, right? We don't want to do that when I is zero, do we? That could. Do you think that would be like the Roman Empire at all? No. Um, no, we I don't want to be plus under money. Oh, uh, but but like only under the conditions where i is greater than zero can be divided both sides by i, right? And in meaningfully, so if i is not equal to zero, what do we have? That's the um, and we could say just to be brutal about it, one over n equals what? One over mu. And then we can do a bunch of Bits of algebra to solve for x. What is what is f here? Well, let's just just so you can follow this. This is f c. I'll write it just in a consolidated way. F c uh, c beta divided by n equals one over mu. So give me if I want to solve that for f. What do I have? What is f? Sorry. Yeah, n divided by what? C beta mu. Now, that may just seem to you the great idea, but it just seems to you kind of bizarre, arbitrary, not simple. But let me assure you that you've done it. That it's actually very insight. And I want to think this through with you. And I want you to get those insights. So you can share them back in seven certain aspects and have appropriate points of sustain. Okay. So first of all, what is n? Population. Population. N is the population, right? I feel neglectful of my internet viewers here. And I'm gonna and I appreciate Wade's putting his back and laboring to empower them. But I'm going to turn this video in my direction um, so at least they can see me holding four months. OK, so n is the population. So what we're talking about is n divided by some constant. It's a certain fraction of the population, right? right? It's, it's, it's a certain fraction of the population, right? What is c beta here? What is that? To the fourth infection, the fourth infection is this whole whole thing over here. Um, it it doesn't have mu. Let let's take this through. What what is c? Not that for it. Hmm? What is beta? Transmission probability per discord contact. Per contact between infected and a susceptible. Right. Hmm? What is mu? How many days they're affected on? Let's suppose you have your first infected population, patient zero. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. They're surrounded, everyone else that surrounds them is what? Susceptible, right? Mm -hmm. So, how many people are they going to infect per day? How many, how many susceptible, so your patients here are surrounded by susceptible. How many people do they make total per day? C, Tyler. C, yeah, C. And then how many people, of those people, how many are they going to infect on that? Tyler, do you have your name? What, what, what is that? Of those, C people, of those C people per day that they mean, what number would be infected by them per day on that? C times beta, right? So if they meet with 100 people per day, and um, all of them, we call it initial patient zero, are susceptible. 100 people per day is meeting initially. And then beta is this chance for each of those contacts they have with a susceptible to chance sell a factor, right? Certain beta was 0.1, 10 percent. They contact with 100 people in total. All of them are susceptible, therefore they're all possibly going to get affected 
and each of them has a 10% chance rolling up very um, risky die of, of, of 10%. So on average, if they have contact with C people overall, all of whom are, are susceptible, and each one of those, so suppose it's 100 people per day, and the probability for infecting each susceptible they run into a point one. How many people per day would they infect on average? A hundred times point one, right? C times beta. You got that? Dimensionally, remember beta is one over for this beta is one over day, right? This is how beta beta serves in the same capacity. It's like a pretty good delay but great, right? Um C is people per per uh people per day? Yeah. Um so uh excuse me, beta, excuse me, what am I saying? What is beta? The beta is a don't ignore what that math man said just there. Okay, um ignore what he said. Um what what is beta? Beta is a what? Probability. I said it from this very floor. Listen to him, not me. Okay, um Beta is a probability. C is one of her is, is, is one of her time. Um and and what is mu days, right? So what is if if they infect each day C times beta and we multiply by the number of days they're infected, what is C times beta so mu? Give me an interpretation. Each day they infect C beta people, and then we multiply by the number of days they infect. Did you have to speak on Tyler? It's like the number of people they infect all the same character. Right. Have you ever heard of something called that? You ever heard of that? Maybe three years earlier? No, it's two years earlier. What is that called? It's called the reproductive number. Basic reproductive. Huh? How many people? When an initial infected be able to infect before, over the entire course of their lives. This is what's called the basic reproduction number, and it actually has a special symbol, which is variously pronounced R0 or R0, with the not being an odd to the British pronunciation of it. Now, this is uh, performed by leading researchers in Britain, such as Kermit and Kendrick. And Ronald Ross and others. So this is n divided by by uh, the basic reproductive number n times one over the basic reproductive number. So if the basic reproductive number is well, you tell me what it is in response. You tell me he or you. You tell me what this is. So what's the basic reproductive number here? Context per day is one. Transmission quality is point one. Uh, the fault recovery time is three. So the effective recovery time is three. What's the basic reproductive number? Six. 20 times point one times three, right? 20 times point one is two times three, right? Six. Mm -hmm. You okay with that? That's the basic reproductive number. So what is the thing? What fraction of the population? Um, and what fraction of the population will of uh, being susceptible will infection equal recovery? At what point will will infection max out? It's when what when when the fraction of people who are susceptible is what the total population divided by what. Okay. One six population. That's when the susceptibles are such that it maxes out the um it, it you, you have too few susceptibles to to cause greater inflow than outflow. Okay, now I wanna I wanna um further though uh deepen this analysis a bit. And I want to ask, I want to take another look at this, if I may. If I may, ladies and gentlemen. So this is one analysis, inflow to outflow for the effect. The effective stock will only go up 
and those two were equal, those two were equal under this condition. The fraction susceptible is one over the basis itself. But there's another way to look at it at more of an individual level. So, when that's the case, that the fraction of the population is sort of susceptible is n divided by by um, uh, by the basic reproductive number, how many people will each infect it infect over the course of their life? That's an interesting thing, and, and I, I like the way Mark's thinking now. In active mind, it's a good thing. But let's let's refine this a bit more. So I wrote this in two different non-trivial dynamical system. Um, <laughs> I think it has a centrifugal, um, it's a centrifugal uh, strength associated with it, and you have to do it at a certain speed for the centrifugal force to keep the lap from blocking the spring. Um, it's my recollection. Okay, so when we have this fraction of the population that are that are uh, susceptible to this practice. I want to I want to ask how many people uh, each infected infects over the course of their own. So that situation, okay. Um, so let's think about this. Okay. So we have an infected, and they're going to be having contact with C C people per day. So. So we're going to heal. Maybe I'll do it over here. Wade, I believe, has memorialized this this part of the board of in the interest of equity and uh, do it over here. It's a bit of real estate here. But, um, so um, we're going to continue. We're going to consider a given impact. That infected is going to have contact with C people per year. That's what we call C. Of those, what fraction are susceptible? Mm -hmm. So, of those people, what fraction are the candidates they can infect? The ones that are susceptible, which is given by what common S over S over right? So, I'm going to write right now, not part of that. And each of them. They have what chance of infecting? What probability of infecting? Beta, good. That's the number of people they infect over the entire time infected for or, or or what? And what day? That is an awesome day. Awesome. They might have said about least things when recognizing the line. So, so that's fine. Um, so C, this is the context per day, the fraction of those contacts that are susceptible and the probability of infecting each of those susceptible contacts, right? So this is like the number of susceptible they have contact with per day, C times S over N, and then you multiply from beta to figure out how many they actually infect, right? So at this point where those two flows are equal, at this point, where those two flows are equal. What is S uh, over N? Read it off for me. for me. What is S over N? Well, S is what? N over R0, the basic reproduction, the basic reproduction. So, ladies and gentlemen, we have C times to flow this N. What do we get? Well, the two Ns cancel, so we get what? That's right. One over R naught, one divided by R naught, the reciprocal of R naught, right? Times beta, and that's per day that they attempt, right? 
And now if we want to consider over the entire course of their illness, what would it be? Okay, now, so it will be C, and I'm going to consolidate this times beta over R9 times mu. Mm -hmm. Or, equally much so, G, C times beta times mu times 1 over R9. Mm -hmm. What is C times beta times mu? What is that? Times beta times you know, is in fact R naught. You see that? C, right? They that C times beta times you know, is the number of people that take at zero would in fact uh, would affect in an otherwise totally susceptible population over the course of their own life. So this is this is R naught. Yeah. Those are not. That's what we just named it or not over here. You know? Right? You said that was or not. Do you remember that? That's or not. That's the number of people patient zero and that and otherwise without being populated under the course of their own. So if we multiply R not by one over R not, what do we get? One. So at the point that these two flows are equal, how many people? Does a given infected in fact over the course of their illness? One. And the argument I gave last time, the description I gave, the analogy of the meta was that of a relay, a baton hat, right? I'm sick. Well, not, right? Uh, imagine I was sick. Um, and when I recover, I pass you the baton, you're sick. I infect one person before I recover. Does the number of infectives go up in that case? No, it just stays the same. I didn't, at any one time, one person is, is, is holding the baton and, and they're passed it on. So at this point where the, the inflow equals outflow. At this point, where we have the maximum number of infectives, each infective is infecting how many people over the course of their illness? Then they're infecting how many people? At that time, where the number of infectives is not going up, the number of down, they're infecting how many people per unit time per over the course of their illness? One thing no, at the very beginning of the whole simulation, as patient zero affected C times beta times mu. That's basic reproductive number. What we're talking about here is this this construct here is what's called R star or R E or the effective reproductive. The number of people that each contested been passed before they recover right now. And at the point where flow equals out flow, that number is low. Before that point, would that number be above one or less than one? Above one. They'll be affecting larger numbers. Remember, one person begets two, then four, yet they what limits that? What limits that? Why does it not continue at its time? Because there are not enough flows. There's not enough susceptible. At some point, the fire is dying out as fast as it's spreading. And that point is found here in these two different points. We can calculate the effective reproductive number. <laughs> Here and what I'm this is a little bit of a misnomer. The effective reproductive number in general, I showed it at this particular time there. The effective reproductive number, this is effective reproductive number, reproductive. Unfortunately, it's sometimes called constant. In general, here is going to be for this model, it's going to be C times S over N. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's going to be times beta 
times n. Because each person, each infective, will be in contact with C infected, so for C to stuff for C total people of the effective brand would be susceptible. And then so I'll multiply a beta for figuring out how many they infect on the duration of their own. So let me because there's some crop going forward, so let me write this down here. Yeah. So this is the effective reproductive number for this model. It's the number of people infected by a given infected at a certain point of time in the model. And it depends on the number susceptible. By the way, what would happen if everyone was susceptible? Basically, everyone in the population is susceptible. What would this be then? It'll be C beta mu, which is equal to what? The basic reproduction. Right? The basic reproduction number, you can think of it as the effective reproduction number, is a very special case of patient zero when all the other population is susceptible. So S over N is what? Right? Uh, but this uh, that applies in that specific case that the entire population is susceptible. This applies when at a certain point in time. Okay, um, time is moving on, but we've got some important ideas here. Basic reproduction number, force that is that the basic humanity, effective reproduction number, <laughs> point of where the, the number of infectives maxes out and it's limited by the number of susceptibles. So all this is good. I'm gonna ask you now, is this a linear model or a nonlinear model? And why is it nonlinear? Where is the nonlinear? I, I alluded to it from this floor, last class, the class before, but I just want to refer to where is it? The nonlinearity means the rate of change of the model, which is going to assist my name as well as captured by the flows. The rate of change depends not just linearly, not just like the sum of constant time stops in the model, um, but instead nonlinearly. And, and one way you can depend nonlinearly is by like multiplication of states of the model. Where is the nonlinear from there? Yes, the nipple. That's done. In a linear system, you could simulate it for susceptible separately from simulating it for factors. Some of the two up and get the result. I'll be a linear system. You can divide up the state of the model into pieces, simulate those pieces, get the results for each of them, and add them together to get the result. You can take things apart and analyze each in isolation and add them up. But in a non-linear system, we need, for example, two to tag it. In order to be effective, you need both, and in, in order for someone to be effective, you need both a lot and a lot. You need both a lot and a lot for there to be effective. Uh, you need an effective and successful. So could you simulate this model only on successful people, get a simulation that have no effective, and then separately, only on effective people, no successful, get a result for that, and then say, well, so figure out how the results for them together, I'll just add those together. Not a chance. Not a chance. No. That's right. Patrick. Yeah, so is any system with a third order delay only in there? No. First order delays are linear. First order delays are linear. Um, and a classic first order delay, you would have some alpha. Times X. Now you might say, well, but wait, there's a, it's not linear in the sense that there are loops, there are causal loops, and that's true. But that's not the sense of nonlinear we're deeply dealing with. Is it loops? No, no, no. This is a linear system. Its behavior, how many people are bringing here, depends literally just a constant of the value of the state. So this is actually a linear system. So one of the other linear systems, we can take them apart, analyze them in pieces, and put them back together. 
And this is how much of you know engineering was traditionally conducted. You take systems apart, you linearize them, you take them apart to their pieces, you analyze them, and you add it together, and you get the result for, for the system as a whole. The problem is when you're a nonlinear system, you can't do that. You have to simulate kind of a system more holistically. You need both of those together. You can't just it's not just about taking it apart, analyzing each piece to get the answer. You have to simulate the interaction, the coupling of the terms, which in this case are coupling to S and R. So this is an, a nonlinear system. This has huge implications for the You get count dependence, you get lock in, you get multiple equilibrium subcomponents. Where it can go to different states depending on where it started. And you can get cases where you get long distance. It can go to one state if you can prevent that thing from happening, but if it goes to an adverse state, it's a lot harder to get out of it than it was to prevent it in the first place. These are the nature of nonlinear systems. You get the multiple equilibrium, you get the half dependent effect, and you get whole being very different from the sum of the parts. And this F times I is the key indicator of that. It may seem small texturally, but its implications, ladies and gentlemen, are profound. Okay. Um, so we're out of time. And uh, I hope this lecture um, gives you some stress for this. I will find that video, make sure when it's posted that I didn't post it, okay? But I've also provided slides on these materials, which walk you through it. No, you don't wanna, maybe you do wanna see that, but I'm not gonna show it to you. Um, okay. So I will, uh, you will find slides on this material, which also goes over them in step-by-step uh, -step form in a, uh, in a set of slides. Okay. Thank you very much. I will speak to you next uh, on Tuesday. We have yet to figure out um, what's going to happen basically for Tuesday. So by default, assume um, that you need to look at your announcement a day before class, okay? Um, chances are virtually certain that I'll have to fly tomorrow. Some important things are occurring today. My dad's in surgery, I think, right now. And um, and we may meet in this classroom on Tuesday, or we may just do it all online. Uh, we'll have to figure that out. And part of that involves the mobile lab. Yes, thank you. Yeah, we're behind on them. I will update the name. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm trying to match up on your page. Okay. So um, do I just email that to you? Uh, yeah, although I will. Um, Right, this is for uh, ways, but yeah. So I will create a hand on the campus, okay? And, and then for the uh, next, uh, do you want to take it? We have all this out right now. Yes, they do. Uh, I can look at it. Okay, thank you. Yes.